Well, why don't we go ahead and get started since uh, we've just got um, an hour, so. All right, you want me to? I'm ready yeah, to get everything off. off, Natalie. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Natalie Thill, and I direct the Adirondack Center for Writing. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here again, partnering with the Adirondack Explorer for our second time. Um, if you are not familiar with the Adirondack Center for Writing, I encourage you to become so. Uh, we do a lot of programs for readers and writers and storytellers throughout the entire region. Everything from writing workshop and publishing advice to high school writing retreats and writer residencies. Um, we do a lot. And uh, we also do a lot of programs intentionally to give a platform for underrepresented voices. One of those programs is actually, we do a prison writing program that we have been doing for so long that I sometimes forget to talk about it. So I thought I'd talk about it today. Um, so we're a dynamic, really interesting organization. You should get to know us. Um, so Adirondack Center for Writing, there's no way you cannot find us on the internet or anywhere you need to be. Um, let me know if you have any questions in the chat. Otherwise, I'm happy to turn the reins over to Adirondack Explorers, Tracy Ormsby. Thank you, Natalie. I'm, I'm also glad to be partnering again with the Adirondack Center for Writing. Um, this is our uh, second webinar together. Uh, we did something on journalism uh, earlier this year and um, I'm, uh, I hope to work together again when the things we're doing uh, intersect this way. So um, really appreciate the work you do in the community promoting writing and especially Adirondack authors. So, um, and welcome to all of you to uh, A Wild Idea, How the Environmental Movement Tamed the Adirondacks. We met Brad um, a couple of years ago when he knocked on the office door of the Adirondack Explorer. And at just about the time we were starting to talk about how we were gonna try and put together a series of articles about the, um, uh, the visionaries, the, the um, uh, heart and soul of the uh, group that came together to form the Adirondack Park Agency. And uh, we were, you know, our challenge was we had a small team, um, um, uh, even smaller uh, at the time. And we were trying to figure out how we were gonna find these, all the people and, uh, interview them and and put it all together. And that was when the universe brought us together with Brad. And he came in and told us about um, 10 years that he had spent interviewing the people who formed the Adirondack Park Agency. Um, and uh, he had videotaped all of the interviews. Um, some of the people uh, were no, no longer with us. And he had all this information and was trying to figure out what to do with it. And so came to us. And so it was perfect. Um, and Brandon and Brad uh, worked together uh, all this time and out of it spun the book. And now I believe there's a documentary um, that is coming out and Brad can tell you more about that. Um, so, uh, and it turned into a series that we've had online first and, um, and, and that is also in the current issue of the magazine, the May, June issue, which I know you all are, are subscribers to the Adirondack Explorer. So you've probably seen it there. If not, I'll at some point uh, during this session, I will drop it into the chat, chat um, box so you can look at it. Um, anyway, so uh, Brad and, and uh, Brandon have been working on this and, and put together uh, the series that we did. And, um, and they're going to talk a little bit more about how that all came together tonight. So before I turn it over to uh, Brad and Brandon, I just want to mention that you should put questions in the Q&A box. Um, by the, at the end, uh, we'll carve out about 15, 20 minutes to take your questions and try to answer as many as we can. And uh, anything we don't get to, we will try to follow up either Brad or Brandon, what, whatever um, answer you're looking for. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brandon and Brad. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Um, so I'm Brandon Loomis, editor at the Adirondack Explorer. I guess the first thing I want to say is that is that uh, the work that I've put into this was not on the book. 
<laughs> other than reading it, which was no work at all. Um, uh, but I have worked with Brad over that time, sort of envisioning how we could uh, uh, sort of double up and, and use these interviews um, for uh, anniversary coverage of our own, which as Tracy said, has happened. Um, and I hope you'll all, if you haven't seen it, you'll either see it in the magazine or, or look at adirondackexplorer.org. Um, first of all, Brad, what, what is that on the wall behind you? That's what the book's about, Brandon. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the big map. That's the, uh, the product that the Adirondack Park Agency produced uh, in uh, released for public comment in December of 1972. And uh, that is uh, the basically it's a regional land use plan for uh, an area the size of Vermont, the Adirondack Park. Looks like a nice place. <laughs> yeah, looks like a complicated map too. Yes, um, I think we'll probably get back to that map. Um, but is is that the original? Or is that that is like that that's way? from the um, from the draft. Uh, version uh, that was released for uh, no, actually, this map is from is the version that was submitted to the legislature. So this is the um, this is the version that the legislature debated over, okay. and they they passed it with uh, very few changes. So uh, this and the people who who whose ideas and drive uh, created created it or created the, the laid the groundwork for it and followed through that's really the subject of your book um yeah. but the the idea of creating such a thing uh, uh, zoning is essentially for a, a place as big as vermont uh, as big as the adirondacks uh was sort of unheard of yes a revolutionary maybe uh, nobody had ever attempted a land use plan on this scale before um, particularly a one this restrictive. Um, there had been large regional land use plans, a couple of them in the United States, um, but they'd all been more or less reliant on uh, voluntary compliance by local agencies. And, um, and this was one of the things that was revolutionary about this was its size, but another was that all of the authority for controlling land use would be in the hands of the state. And you know, uh, zoning is ordinarily a, uh, a town and local um, uh, affair. So that was really the crux of what made this such a, a controversial plan inside the park is that the local people felt like their authority was being taken away from them. So b before we get into uh, some of the personalities and, and what it took uh, to do this and, and what, what the response was, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about, about why. why. Why was this even an issue? Why was it uh, considered important by many? That's, uh, a great question. That's a great question. You know, but what I, what I try to do um, in my career is, is study uh, social change and how social how social changes take place, and um, the general structure is that a very small, uh, very committed group of activists pushes uh, for a result for a long time, usually decades, um, and then uh, and then after decades of of pushing, uh, the thing catches fire, and um, all of a sudden it seems a big change occurs, but actually had been in the works for a long time. The groundwork was for this plan was laid 20 years before the legislature passed it. And um, the thing that caused it to catch fire really was a pervasive sense that the Adirondacks were about to be ruined by uh, large scale second home developments. And that um, concern among the voters of New York was really wrapped up with a tremendous uh, increase in concern for environmental protection that happened in the last half of the 1960s. So this act was passed in 1971, right at the pinnacle of the public's concern uh, for pollution and overcrowding and waste and other environmental matters. It was passed right during the same time as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, 
um, the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. So it was, it was a product of a lot of work, a lot of planning, but also uh, incredibly good timing. And, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially the, the problem at the time that people were seeking to solve had to do with the private lands. The, there was, the, you, have, you have an Adirondack Park, which is uh, part state lands, uh, forever wild, the forest preserve, that's, that's, I don't know if you call it untouchable, but it's, it's preserved. And <laughs> you have uh, pr private lands also within the park, which I guess some people felt were in, in, potential uses for them were incompatible with with this. Yeah, I think that's landscape scheme. Yeah, that that sets the table pretty well. There were actually two plans. Um, there was a plan for the state land, uh, which was the product of concern over uh, more or less, you know, what the environmental community thought were lax practices by the state conservation department and a and a, a need for a master plan for the forest preserve, for the state-owned land inside the Adirondack Park. But the far bigger deal was the sense that there were virtually no controls on what could be done in the private land in the park, 3.5 million acres of private land, which surrounds these state lands. And of course, any development on the private land would have a huge effect on the quality of the public land, uh, because this is supposed to be a, a park which maintains uh, an open space quality, a wild quality. And right around the time that the, uh, that the law was introduced, several developers of second home projects had announced plans for subdivisions of anywhere from 4,000 to 10,000 lots uh, that would be built on private land in the park. And this gave the environmental community statewide a perfect uh, thing to rally around. Um, we've got to stop these subdivisions, uh, and that's what really drove the um, drove the legislature to pass the law. That and the incredible power of Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller, the governor at the time. Correct. Probably the most powerful governor in the history of New York. Um, and besides the the sheer number of of houses in in these kinds of envisioned uh, developments that you're talking about. Was there also, um, was there a feeling that there was a lack of concern for particular natural resources, for wetlands, for wildlife? Was, was there a sense that it was not uh, uh, well thought out? Yeah, there, there was, a, there was a, a new way of thinking about land use that was just sort of coming to the fore. And the staff that uh, put together the uh, private land plan for the park seized on this new way of thinking and integrated it into their, uh, into their land use plan. And the, the big idea was uh, you know, what we would call carrying capacity. How much development can a given parcel of land take without um, degrading the environmental quality of the surrounding parcels of land? And this was uh, at the time, 1970, 69, uh, this, this was, uh, identified with a particular uh, writer and a landscape architect at the University of Pennsylvania named Ian McHarg, M-C-H-A-R-G, uh, whose, whose work was incredibly influential. And it involved um, looking at resources like wetlands, soil types, slopes, and other uh, natural aspects of, uh, of open space, and uh, basically putting a check mark next to an acre if it had something that uh, made it fragile. Um, and that would also include uh, a wildlife resource, a scenic vista, rare plants and, and so forth. So the, so the APA staff uh, spent a lot of time in their cars in 1971 and 72, driving around um, and looking at each acre and basically rating it according to how well it could stand to be developed. And um, so the wetlands were clear, concern for wetlands was clearly a big part of it. And so on the map behind you there, the, the different colors, uh, besides, I think some of it is forest preserve, right? One color and then uh, some of yeah. it, is, but, but it also lays out like, here's here's where some higher density can happen that where it makes sense to have uh, 
you know, towns basically, villages. Yeah, um, yeah the, shades, the shades of green in the map are roughly equivalent to the areas of the park where there are big restrictions on the density of development, the number of buildings per square mile that can be built. A lot of the green is the state forest preserve, which is protected by the, uh, the state constitution and no tree cutting or building can happen in the, in the state lands at all. Uh, but the other green land um, and, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the yellow land, uh, rural use, those are the two most restrictive categories in the uh, land use plan. They cover about 85% of the private land in the park. And uh, they limit development to roughly uh, one building for every eight acres in the yellow zones and one building for every, I think, 43 acres maybe in the, in the uh, resource management zones. So the, the land use plan really was very, very strict. Most of the land that's in those restrictive areas was in private forests. Um, it didn't have anything built on it. And the, the idea was to keep it that way. And I guess the result all these years later is that we still, we do have a, a landscape that's relatively cohesive and, and, and wild. And we also have uh, continuing debate about how to manage it, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think, you know, one of the things that the plan did was it said uh, the areas where there are buildings now, uh, you'll be able to continue having buildings in those areas. But, um, but the idea of, of sprawl or uh, a new community or um, any kind of a massive development into the open space was kind of squashed uh, by the APA plan. So the development that has happened in the Adirondacks since 1973 has been crowded into about 15% of the private land in the park, which is I think less than 10% of the entire acreage. So, um, so it immediately took a lot of land off the table for building. So besides creating this map uh, and, and zones, uh, the, the act created the agency? Correct, and the agency and, enforced the law. And, and, the, and this also was revolutionary to have, uh, have such a-, such yeah. a yeah, it was authority. revolutionary for a state agency to be given authority over that much land where, you know, including, the, I think there's something like a hundred towns uh, and villages in the Adirondacks, and ordinarily they have control over their own zoning. The original idea was that the towns and villages were going to draft local ordinances that would be up to the standards of the state law. And then when they had passed those stronger zoning ordinances, the, uh, the APA would relax its um, oversight over that town that had that new law. But because of the very widespread and very passionate uh, opposition to the APA Act, very few towns and villages passed those laws because it was kind of death to a local official to, um, to be seen as someone who was cooperating with the APA. You mentioned uh, Nelson Rockefeller, uh, also a character in your book is his brother, mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence. Um, who I believe had a hand in uh, uh, envisioning uh, national monuments and, and parks elsewhere. Uh, yes. And he also, had, he also had that plan here. Can you talk a little bit about what he envisioned and why it didn't happen? Yeah, you know, one of the things that kept me interested in this project for such a long time uh, was learning that so much of the, um, so many of the important um, aspects of this story revolved around personal relationships. And one of the most important relationships was the relationship between Governor Nelson Rockefeller and his younger brother, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence was two years younger. Nelson and Lawrence were best friends. They were best friends for their entire lives. And Lawrence's passion, which was part of the Rockefeller family's sort of philanthropic mission, was creating great parks. The Rockefeller family had a hand in creating uh, Acadia National Park in Maine, uh, Great Smoky Mountain Park. Uh, Lawrence himself more or less personally created Virgin Islands National Park. 
Um, he had a primary role in Jackson Hole National Park and the Redwoods National Park. So Lawrence was a park builder and Lawrence really coveted the Adirondacks. He thought the Adirondacks could be a really great addition to the national park system because it was relatively close to so many people. It's within a day's drive of, I think, one sixth or one fifth of the United States population. So Lawrence really wanted to turn the Adirondacks into a national park uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that he, he liked the national park model, but another was that if the, uh, if the Adirondacks were taken over by the federal government, um, then the forever wild clause would be gone. And national parks actually have a lot more development and a lot more accommodation of automobiles and motorized recreation than the Adirondack Park does. So Lawrence was pushing his brother to turn the Adirondacks over to the federal government and make it a national park. He proposed that it become a national park and that proposal more or less blew up in his face. Everybody in New York, you know, in New York politics, you never reach consensus, but everybody in New York agreed um, that turning the Adirondacks over to the federal government was a terrible idea. The idea went nowhere. Um, but because Nelson loved his brother and because his brother wasn't finished yet, he set up a commission to study uh, the question of what to do with the Adirondacks and how to save it in the face of all of this development that was um, uh, threatening to take place. And so what happened on the, the temporary study commission more or less turned into a, into a battle of visions between the Lawrence Rockefeller National Park vision and the much older, more traditional uh, forever wild vision. And the, the forever wilders um, more or less won hands down. And just you know, probably most people who are observing this understand what forever wild is, but it's a state constitutional provision that says that forest preserve lands remain forever wild, essentially. Yeah, and I think more um, in this, in this context, the, the way I describe it is um, a commitment to the idea that the Adirondack Park should appear to be uh, wild. It should, be, it should give you the feeling of vast open space. Um, and uh, you know, the federal definition of wilderness is where man, where man is a visitor who does not remain. And that is the management uh, strategy that the Temporary Study Commission recommended be um, uh, adopted by the Adirondack Park Agency, and which in fact the Adirondack Park Agency did pass into law. So basically, I mean, you're saying that, that the, the feeling of conservationists in New York at that time was that they could do better than the federal government at protecting the wild character. Of Absolutely. Um, there was a great deal of um, there was a great deal of pride um, in the Adirondack Park, a feeling that um, New York, uh, you know, that, that, that this was I think the New York Times called it uh, the state's most important asset at one point and um, and that and that the state could do a better job of managing it than the federal government could. And that national park would not have been the whole Adirondack Park. All of it, it would have been sort of centered on the high, high peaks, the core of the park, I guess. Yeah, that was, that was part of the problem with Lawrence Rockefeller's proposal is, you know, the, the, he wanted uh, 1.6 million acres of the Adirondacks, including most of the high peaks, most of the um, sort of marquee lakes, and the, and the central Adirondacks from, from Indian Lake up to Whiteface, basically. Um, and, but the park is 6 million acres. So the state conservation people were immediately saying, uh, you know, what are we gonna do with the other 4.6 million acres here? Um, there's nothing about this in the national park proposal. So Lawrence Rockefeller wanted to turn the Adirondacks into the, what would have been the third largest national park in the United States. But that proposal still left out 70% of the state park. So really the, the Adirondack Park in 1971 was by far the largest park in the United States. And it's the third largest now. There's two other larger parks in Alaska, but, um, but the vast size of it really made it uh, unsuitable to be a national park. So let's talk a little about the, the people who made it happen and the people it affected uh, and the people you interviewed. Um, 
and first of all, how, how did that come about? How, how, I think Tracy <laughs> said you spent years on it. How, how did it happen and, and how did you conduct it and why? Well, I mean, Brandon, you and I are both reporters. Um, and I think you probably understand um, the feeling that you get when you, uh, when you come upon something that is really, really good um, and really complicated. And you just get a strong desire to follow this story uh, all the way to the end. And so that's basically what happened to me. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who had been involved in the uh, original um, lobbying campaign to pass the act um, and who had access to uh, grant funds encouraged me to apply for a grant because he was concerned that some of the people who passed the law and lobbied for the law were aging and had not told their stories. I have a fair amount of experience in doing oral history interviews. So he um, arranged for me to go up and conduct these interviews uh, with the people who made the APA happen. And uh, as I, I spent five years doing that, and as I proceeded further into the story, learning more about the story, I got more and more interested in the people who were opposed to the APA and the idea of, um, of uh, how the local residents uh, saw the law and, and what they did to try to stop it. Um, the environmental movement was, it, it was and continues to be fairly well-funded um, in the Adirondacks and uh, largely because of Harold Hochschild and the Adirondack Museum uh, and several other repositories, every scrap of paper having to do with the environmental movement's uh, campaign to save the Adirondacks has been saved and uh, categorized and is available in archives. Virtually no archival material, no interviews had ever been done about the local opposition to the APA. So I made sure to, to um, interview the people I could find who had led the opposition and um, I began to see this as a two-sided story, not just a, you know, not just a, a holy campaign to save a beautiful wild area, but also um, the imposition of state power on, um, on ordinary people who weren't all that thrilled about it happening. So let's, let's talk about some of them. What, who were they and what motivated them? And, what, well, you, uh, and how did they feel about what happened? Uh, you know, as I, as I said earlier, a lot of this hinges on individuals and personalities. And, um, you, you know, the, um, when, the, when the plan was released, uh, the, when the map behind me was released to the public and the plan started to circulate, it was up in the, inside the blue line for the people who lived there full time. It was just a sort of an unbelievable thing. Just it was like, how could this possibly uh, take place. And um, the few people who really understood uh, what was being proposed and what would change as a result of it uh, started organizing uh, against it. And probably the most important of them was this guy named Tony Delia, who was, uh, a, he was a, a developer, but he was not a big pocket corporate developer. He was a guy who had cashed in all of his life savings and persuaded a bunch of his friends to join him and had mortgaged a, a, a stretch of land uh, about 18 miles north of Saranac Lake called Loon Lake Estates. And Tony knew as soon as the plan was published um, that if the law took effect and the density requirements became law, Loon Lake Estates was in a lot of trouble and his life savings could be wiped out. So this was over Christmas weekend uh, that the plan was released. And Tony spent that Christmas holiday writing an essay, uh, more or less dissecting the proposal and explaining to local people that this was gonna be the end of the local economy. The children would have to leave to find jobs, so forth and so on. And then the, Ser the town supervisor of Saranac Lake printed up Tony's essay and left it around town for people to read. So that by the time uh, the APA public hearing in Saranac Lake happened a month after the plan was released, people in the Tri Lakes area were incredibly whipped up against this idea. And that uh, Saranac Lake hearing on, I think, January 21st, 
1973 was pretty close to a riot, according to the people who I talked to who were there. Um, but a lot of it was because of this, the tireless efforts of these people who, um, who really saw that their oxes were going to be gored um, if this plan passed. And it, it became, I guess you, you said that it was, it, was, it was emotional, right? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about it was that for the vast majority of the full-time residents of the park, the law would have uh, no effect whatsoever on their property or how they live their lives. Um, one of the things that this uh, temporary study commission found when it did an analysis of all the private land in the park is that only about one quarter of the private land in the Adirondacks is owned by residents of the Adirondacks. Three quarters of it is owned by corporations and, uh, and families that live outside of the park. And then the vast majority of the full-time park residents live in hamlets and villages and the areas right around hamlets and villages where the APA laws really wouldn't have had very much of an effect. So although um, the law really wouldn't have um, hurt the vast majority of the people inside the park, it just felt like an insult. It felt like um, people from downstate who had been pushing them around for a hundred years. And a lot of the people who had been pushing them around worst uh, were named Rockefeller, that these people were coming back in and were uh, sort of moving all the chairs around and messing things up and saying, you can't do it well enough yourself. We've got to take over. And it just felt like a, like an insult. Was there anyone in particular who, who sort of epitomized that viewpoint for you in your conversations with them? Oh, oh yeah. I, I would say, um, well, the, Frank Cashier uh, was another developer. So he had, he had something to lose personally. Um, Frank Cashier uh, was not financially ruined as Tony Delia was. Frank Cashier was a pretty smart developer. And as soon as he saw that the APA law was gonna pass, he started investing heavily in South Florida. So he got out and he continued to make uh, good money. But he was a lifelong resident of the park and uh, you know, sort of one of the big uh, citizens of Saranac Lake at the time. And he just um, was enraged by the idea of the state coming in and, and enforcing this law. Um, someone who knew him at the time told me that he kept a sort of a, a, a gracious and business-like demeanor in public presentations and when he was meeting with APA officials, but when he was talking about it in private, this person told me that he would get so angry that he would just start shaking uh, when he started to talk about it. So uh, Frank, it was really personal for Frank. Um, it, 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 did that come through in his conversation? I mean, you talked to him personally, right? Yeah, I, I interviewed Frank a couple of times. And, and yes, I mean, he really felt like uh, he was a freedom fighter, um, that privately owned land was not part of a state park, um, and that the state had no right to tell you uh, what you could do uh, with privately owned land, that maybe the town maybe the town that you lived in could tell you what to do on privately owned land, but the state certainly could not do it. That was his position. And he took that very personally. Uh, so he, he spent a lot of money and a lot of time uh, organizing against the APA and was fairly effective at it. How so e effective? Uh, he had something called the war wagon. Some of the, some of your, uh, some of our listeners tonight uh, who were around during the time might remember a gigantic, um, not, it was, wasn't, wasn't gigantic, it was like a bread delivery truck um, that uh, he painted blue. And on the side of it, he painted abolish the APA. There's a picture of the war wagon on the Adirondack Explorers uh, series that we put together, uh, the beginning of part one, I think. And uh, so he would load the war wagon up with, with local people, sort of young people who you know were sort of rowdy and wanted to raise hell and march around with signs and, and uh, you know, make threatening gestures and so forth. And then older people who would pack public hearings and meetings so that you know, this was sort of a, a portable, um, uh, you know, a, a, a porta outrage uh, 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 delivery van. Um, and that went on for a couple of years. He also funded a newspaper called the Adirondack Defender that was tipped in to the Saranac Lake um, newspaper, the Adirondack Daily Enterprise. Uh, 
Um, and the editor of the daily, the owner of the Daily Enterprise at that time, William Doolittle, who I also interviewed, who's still around, uh, also felt like the Adirondack Park Agency was just uh, really overreaching and that it was rich people pushing poor people around in Doolittle's view. So uh, th they found themselves up against some, some rather passionate, dedicated people uh, who, of course, ultimately prevailed with this act. Uh, and they were not all named Rockefeller. They were not all, uh, I, I don't think what you'd call, what, what might be called elitists. Uh, uh, one of them was named Clarence Petty. Uh, he was an Adirondacker, yes. And maybe you can speak a little bit about what he was about and why he became involved in this and what he meant to the to the effort. Yeah, I think um, the um, that's a good point, Brandon, that, you know, the uh, the views of park residents at the time of the act was passed were not united. Um, a lot of park residents were in favor of the act, um, a minority, but still a sizable amount. And a lot of uh, park residents didn't like the idea of the state taking over, but they hated the idea of the second home developments even more. So they just kind of stood aside and let the law pass because they really wanted these massive second home developments to be stopped. So the hardcore opposition that organized and rallied against the APA was really only a minority of park residents, but they were extremely vocal and passionate minority. Clarence, uh, was really one of my favorite parts of this entire project. And luckily I, I, I interviewed him uh, right at the beginning in 2002. He was 98 years old. Uh, Clarence, uh, many of our listeners tonight uh, will have met Clarence or known of Clarence, um, but he lived his more or less his entire life inside the Adirondack Park. He was a forest ranger uh, and a pilot for the State Conservation Department. And just a delightful guy, um, you know, a, a font of, of uh, stories and local knowledge. Just an he, he basically individual. grew up in the woods, right? I mean, yeah, he was born in a squatter's cabin on the shores of Lower Saranac Lake in a place called Indian Carry. Uh, his father was a guide and uh, they, lived, uh, they lived on Indian Carry. And then he, they later built a house a few miles away from there. But his father uh, was a wilderness guide for the wealthy families who uh, spent the summer on Saranac Lake. And then in the off season, his father was the caretaker for a great camp. So um, this, this kind of relationship between local people and wealthy camp owners wasn't just uh, one of resentment. It was also one of, of economic dependence. It was a good job to be a caretaker. Uh, and it was an even better job to be a state forest ranger. So because the Petties, um, you know, sort of did fairly well for themselves, um, Clarence, um, as a ranger, was different than most rangers of that era because he really embraced the idea of forever wild. And he really saw that a lot of the ways in which the state was managing the forest preserve were, in his view, wrong, that they were allowing a lot of illegal cabins, a lot of illegal roads, a lot of garbage dumps, a lot of things that shouldn't, in his view, have been there. And he worked um, for years to document that those conditions and bring them to the attention of the state legislature several years before the Adirondack Park Agency was passed. And, and he, he went after the, after the act was passed, he also had a role, right? Yeah, no, he was, um, yes, he, he was sort of the, the senior uh, talent um, on the Adirondack Park Agency's early staff. He was clearly the guy who knew more about the Adirondack Park than anyone else alive. And so um, when the, you know, the, the Adirondack Park Agency had this brilliant um, uh, assistant director, George Davis, who was really the architect of the, of the land use plan, George was only 29 years old when the APA Act was passed, and Clarence was 65, but Clarence and George worked really well together, and George, who was a hardcore environmentalist, um, uh, found a kind of a soulmate in Clarence and um, really relied on him 
um, more or less as, um, you know, kind of a living encyclopedia. Uh, another naturalist for the Conservation Department, Greenfield Chase, uh, also served that role for the APA staff. Like most of the staff, like George Davis, uh, were in their 20s or early 30s. It was their first job out of, out of school, pretty much. And George Davis was also from the, the, the region, right? I mean, he came by this love of the Adirondacks naturally. Yeah, George Davis came from a blue collar family living in the small town of Canton, which is just south of Tug Hill. So he's from the North Country, uh, born and raised, but, uh, but quite a bright and extremely hardworking guy. And he was always fascinated by the idea of how you protect the integrity of natural systems, uh, particularly in a place that is, is supposedly protected by the forever wild clause. So when he was approached by another key figure, Harold Jerry, the director of the Temporary Study Commission and asked uh, to come to work, he, he was a graduate student at that time at Cornell. And when he was approached by Harold Jerry, it was like, you know, he would get paid four times as much to study the same problem that he was gonna be studying as a graduate student. Essentially, George Davis's doctoral thesis became the Adirondack Park Agency. And did any of them tell you anything that 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 really? I mean, what did what did Clarence Petty tell you that stuck with you that made it clear why this was so important? Uh, well, Clarence and his um, and his uh, hiking partner Neil Stout, who went around documenting all of these um, abuses of the forever wildland, they told me you know several stories about things that they saw in the late fifties and early. 1960s, and both of them mentioned uh, an illegal hunting camp um, that they saw uh, where the, um, the hunters had built their outhouse over a stream uh, and the stream drained into a town's water supply. Um, and they were both like, you know, what, what were you thinking, guys? Um, and so, so Clarence was full of great stories like that. Um, many of Clarence's stories didn't have to do directly with the APA, but they illuminated some of the big themes um, that are sort of behind this story that, that kept me interested in it. Uh, a lot of our uh, listeners tonight will have heard of the hermit Noah John Rondeau, who was a squatter who lived on state land um, in the high peaks, just about 16 miles away from the Petty's house. And uh, Clarence and Noah John Rondeau were friends. Clarence would hike over to Rondeau's camp, uh, his illegal camp in the High Peaks Wilderness, and uh, because the fishing was so good there. And at one point, Clarence asked Rondeau, um, "Do you ever get? Because he lived, Rondeau lived alone. Clarence said, "Do you ever get scared out here by yourself? I mean, what happens if you cut yourself with an axe?" And Rondeau's reply was, "You got no business cutting yourself with an axe." And that was sort of a, in putting, you know, in, a, in one line, this sort of extreme um, self-reliance um, that was held up so proudly by full-time park residents um, that, if, that if you screwed up, it was your business, you were either gonna get yourself out of it or you were gonna die. Well, it also gives you a, gives you a sense of, of how, how uh, wild and remote the place was that you could even live that kind of life. Uh, yeah, in 1960s, 70s America. Yeah, yeah Rondo uh, finally moved out uh, after a gigantic storm in 1950 made it too difficult for him to get around. He finally. Oh, so he left. was going about the 50s. Yeah, he the okay. big blowdown. It was called in 1950. After that, it was too uh, hard for him to get around, and he was in his 60s then. So he moved into town, and actually, Noah Rondo died uh, in Sarah, in Lake Placid. And he was uh, uh, taking state welfare at the time. So he died on welfare. Self-reliance, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah. So I, uh, I guess we, we need to sort of explain how, how this happened, how it, you, know, you had such, such uh, backlash and uh, opposition to, to this concept. Uh, you mentioned uh, the name Harold Hochschild before. I think he played a, a significant role in making it happen. Um, but can you can you sort of put the pieces together politically? How, how did this succeed? So Hochschild was one of the commissioners of the Temporary Study Commission 
the thing that Nelson Rockefeller appointed after his brother's national park idea blew up. And Hochschild was a, a, a lifelong um, camp owner. He had inherited a, a beautiful camp on Blue Mountain Lake from his father. Hochschild was also a very successful business executive, a global mining executive. And his passion was uh, the history of the Adirondacks. He was the founder and for many years, the sole funder of the Adirondack Museum in Blue Mountain Lake. So he, he really loved the Adirondacks. He was also an old man when he was uh, in this part of his, the story, he was in his later seventies. He was retired from his mining career. So he was kind of sitting at his great camp um, and uh, he got the chance to be on this commission and he was a, a man of such great abilities and also uh, really powerful connections um, that he, he used his skill, a great deal of cunning, a great deal of diplomatic skill and a great deal of favors that he called in from various powerful people uh, to essentially beat Nelson Rockefeller um, at this game. Uh, he became the chairman of the Temporary Study Commission and essentially pushed this vision for the Adirondack Park Agency into law, even though um, Lawrence Rockefeller was dead set against it. And Nelson Rockefeller, who was at, you know, in his heart, was a politician, had to be convinced that this was a winning political idea statewide. Could this have happened today if, if, the, if we were having this debate? And uh... I don't think so. I think that um, conserva conservation is making great strides in the Adirondacks and elsewhere, but it's happening differently now. Um, the Adirondack Park Agency was sort of the, the, maybe the ultimate expression of a top-down government solution to a problem. And, you know, one of the things I really was challenged to do in this book is to explain to readers that in the late 1960s and early 1970s, a lot of Americans had faith um, that their state and federal governments were gonna do the right thing. And that when you had a complex social problem, you should leave it up to the people who are uh, legislating to solve it. And the Adirondack Park Agency was an expression of, the, of statewide voters' faith in uh, the governor and legislators to protect this asset. Um, I think that faith in government is, is, has eroded significantly now. And so most of the advances that are taking place in conservation are happening in different ways, although the movement has found new ways uh, to save land that are pretty effective. Uh, so what kind of a model do you think the Adirondack Park Agency and, and the Adirondack Park as it exists have through these years given to the country and the world? And, um, and, and where do you think, how do you think it can be influential in the future or, or you know, be used as a model elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great question because on one level, you know, I just said it could never happen again. The idea of a state agency having zoning authority over 6 million acres of land. I mean, I just don't know anywhere else. I just don't know anywhere in the United States or most parts of the world for that matter, where something like that could happen again. But, but really, if you put that aside, the big idea here, the, the, you know, the, the reason I called the book a wild idea was that the, the motivating um, force behind this, um, this agency was what came to be known as landscape level conservation. The idea of protecting entire landscapes um, rather than just protecting a, a small uh, plot of ground where an endangered species lives, protecting the entire ecosystem that supports um, that species um, was the motivating factor behind the, uh, the state land master plan and the private land plan for the APA. So that idea of landscape level conservation has become incredibly important um, now because of um, an, a, a challenge that no one in 1971 really was aware of, which is the, the challenge of climate change. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, I was really, really surprised and intrigued uh, shortly after Joe Biden took office, he announced that his administration's goal is to see that 30% of the territory of the United States has some form of land protection um, from, is, will be protected from development in order to uh, combat climate change because an intact forest is one of the greatest, um, is probably the greatest method we know of for uh, draining carbon out of the atmosphere. So Biden wants to push the, um, the percentage of United States territory that's protected from development from currently, I think it's 12% of the land. He wants to push it to 30%. And uh, I don't know if he's gonna be able to do that. I'm not sure what that would look like. Uh, and a lot of it would be already land that's already publicly owned. But it, if that is a serious uh, uh, policy proposal, it's going to involve landscape level conservation on a scale that makes the Adirondack Park Agency look small. I, I think I see Tracy there. I have more questions and I can continue, but I, I'm sure that we have some from the audience. So we'll, we'll yeah, see about we, it. We do have a few coming in. So um, uh, I think I'll, we'll take those and see how many we can fit in here. Uh, from Dan Musman. How far outside of Saranac, the Saranac Lake area did the war wagon travel? And were any other communities similarly organized or active in the opposition? Yeah, Dan, that's a great question. I think the war wagon went all over the park. I know that it went to Star Lake and Lake George. Um, I believe that it, there were hearings in Speculator. It basically followed the Adirondack Park Agency officials uh, when they were having public hearings um, you know, in, in a place like Lake Pleasant, um, they, the war wagon would, would follow them down and make sure that um, there were angry people with picket signs outside the, uh, outside the meeting hall. So it went all over the park. Um, and the second half of the question was, um, what was it, Tracy? Uh, whether any other communities were similarly organized. Yeah, that, that is a great question because there were um, there were efforts um, outside of Saranac Lake. Saranac Lake was probably the biggest and most, um, most energetic, but there was a, a pervasive sense of dissatisfaction and anger, more or less in every community of the park. Um, but, and, and, and there were small scale efforts to organize in other parts of the park. But the reason why they didn't prevail was that they didn't ever work together. Um, they never united. And if they had, um, they could have pushed the home rule argument in a much stronger way, which would have convinced a lot more state legislators that this uh, APA was a usurpation of home rule and uh, you know, was a bridge too far. But really, um, one of the things that um, Peter Payne, man we haven't mentioned, who's still with us, uh, who was a, a key player in every phase of this story. He made a really good point, which was that in 1971 and even today, a lot of people don't really think of the Adirondacks as one place. They think of it as a region, sort of a pie-shaped region where the point of the, uh, of the slice of pie is a city uh, where the hospital is and where, you, uh, where the newspaper is published. And um, you know, and so it's six or seven different places and they never work together. Uh, uh, Bob Meyer just um, mentions Warrensburg and the, the APA sign, which I believe is now in the museum. Is that right, Brad? Yes, they, 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 the museum got that sign. Um, and one of the things that I'm really enjoying, um, Tracy and Bob is, um, uh, collecting more artifacts from people who were against the APA uh, and making sure that they get into the, uh, into the museum because historians only study the things that they can see. And um, so those things need to be saved. If anybody has any cool stuff, um, let me know. Uh, and Brad, what was the most surprising thing you uncovered in your research for the book? Uh, there were a lot of surprising things. One of the things that I thought was really kind of uh, ironic and cool 
was that when George Davis, before he was hired um, by the APA, he went back to Cornell and went back into the PhD program. And uh, he had three kids and uh, you know a graduate student's salary. So he really had to take outside work. He was hired by a developer named Louis Paparazzo who wanted to build 4,000 units to 7,000 units on 18,000 acres north of Tupper Lake in a, 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 a development called Tondelay. Paparazzo uh, portrayed himself as an environmentally sensitive developer. And so he uh, did the cutting edge thing in 1970, which was to write uh, an environmental impact statement. Nobody really was writing environmental impact statements in 1970 yet, but Paparazzo got in touch with George Davis and said, hey, uh, walk around and write me a report about the natural qualities of this land that I own so that I can uh, make sure that I develop it in a responsible way. So George Davis said, okay, although he thought that Paparazzo's development plan was really a bad idea, he took the money, he walked around Paparazzo's land for several weeks, testing this method of, of rating each acre's suitability for development. He wrote a report for Paparazzo, Paparazzo paid him, Paparazzo ignored the report, and uh, it was basically the proof of concept for the Adirondack Park Agency, which ended up saying no to Paparazzo. That's one story, there's yeah. lots. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't see any more questions in there right now, if anybody wants to add some before we uh, wrap up here. But um, Brad, do you want to talk a little bit about the um, documentary that's being made? Yeah, there's a documentary and also this research is continuing. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, the uh, Mountain Lake Public Broadcasting um, in association with the Adirondack Museum uh, is putting together a one hour version of this uh, book um, that uses some of the interview uh, footage that I shot um, 18 years ago, as uh, along with a bunch of other stuff um, to, uh, to tell the story uh, on, um, on PBS. We expect that will air um, in October uh, is the current thinking. Uh, there's gonna be a sneak preview of it um, at the Adirondack Museum's um, symposium on, on uh, June 27th, the Adirondack Experience Museum is having a day long symposium on the Adirondack Park Agency at 50. And we're gonna be showing uh, the first uh, uh, clip from that uh, documentary at that symposium. So uh, if you wanna check it out, register for that. And I also wanted to say um, when the pandemic uh, hit, I had to stop my research. Luckily I had done enough to complete uh, this book that's just been published. But I have a lot more research on the early years of the APA and also the big land deals that took place in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, starting really with uh, an easement on Rockefeller family property in Bay Pond and culminating with the Finch Prime deal in 2007. And I intend to turn that into a book uh, that I'll be working on uh, and finishing up starting the, later this year. And I'm also wondering, Brad, how many people in total did you interview for this project approximately? I think it's up to around 60 now. Um, and um, yeah, I think about 60. I, I, tried to, I, I tried to keep pretty careful track because these were not a sort of newspaper style brief, um, get a quote and hang up the phone interviews. These were oral history interviews. Um, many of them lasted, uh, you know, several hours. George Davis's interview was six hours. I talked to Clarence Petty four times. So these are, these are in-depth conversations. Okay. I think uh, I just want to mention that uh, some of these people are, are on the webinar tonight. So um, oh. sort of sort of exciting after after reading the story. So well, I don't um, have that list. I'd, be, I'd love to love to know. <laughs>
And I also um, want, think we should just give a plug for your book, Brad. It's uh, bradedmondson.com. You can buy it there. And I, I just went to the website and I see there's a there's a discount code right now. So yeah, 30% off. And actually, you know, uh, I should give you a shout out, Tracy, because uh, you came up with the title for this book. A Wild Idea was Tracy's, uh, I, I had was going to call it something else. And I sent out a poll uh, to people who were involved in the project. And Tracy said, you know, why don't you just call it a wild idea? You know, when headlines are weird, you know, when somebody comes up with the right headline, um, you know it immediately. And uh, so thanks to Tracy for naming this book. I, um, and I stole it from Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, you can, Cornell University Press is the publisher and um, ordering it on their website uh, will get it to you uh, a little bit cheaper than Amazon Prime and um, from, a, from a much uh, better business anyway. I, so I, go to, uh, I should say, my website is awildidea.com and um, that's the place to go to get the discount. I have one more question. I don't, Tracy, do you have anything more before I ask? No. It? Um, Brad, at the end of your book, in the notes at the end of your book, um, you mentioned a canoe trip that you took when you were young. And I wonder if you could speak to what, I mean, how, how did that affect you? And, and maybe more to the point, um, did how the, the work that we've been talking about, the, the, the subject matter that we've been talking about tonight, what, what do you think is the lasting effect for people like the young Brad uh, <laughs> who, who will come along in the future? Well, I was from Florida. I was from a, I grew up in a small town in Florida and um, my uncle uh, who was living in New Jersey invited my older brother and I to go on a Boy Scout um, 100 mile canoe trip down the Racket River when I was 14. So not only had I never been on a long uh, expedition like that before, I had never really seen mountains before. Um, so you can imagine the effect um, that the Adirondacks had on this 14-year-old uh, mind, I never really got over it. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the sort of spiritual calming and, and um, uh, uh, sort of meditative properties of being in a uh, wild land were something that really hooked me deeply, uh, starting with that canoe trip and have, have stayed with me ever since. And I think that um, what this story is really about is um, the, uh, how much people who grow up in urban and suburban settings really benefit from having access to that kind of territory and who really, who really need it. People really feel um, that it's a source of spiritual renewal to go into places like these. It certainly was for me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brad, very much for uh, your book and for this evening. And thanks, Brandon and Natalie. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks for inviting me. This was really a lot of fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye. bye.